Welcome to the Nod Badger for the week ending June 11th, 2016. Here, thanks to our hardworking serfs and our fields of content, we have compiled a collection of funny, interesting, and hopefully useful clips from our most watched shows. The volunteer efforts of our very happy and totally not overworked peons have produced a bountiful selection of soft and rich cotton in the form of select clips. Enjoy the spoils of their hard work. First, we'll start with Dr. Rana McCam and Baring as they come together with Allison and a self-hating victim of white guilt to make a trio, qu qu quartet, quartet I suppose, of bad music made somewhat passable with the ranging number 37, barely bearable in B. G'day, Allison. Hey, I like your hat. Gay. Um, did you just say K, G'day, or Gay? Gay. 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 So this is a white privilege song by Josh is not a robot. Hi there. Hello, Josh. Yes, hello. Not a robot. Hey, Josh. Thanks for joining me today. Why were you coming apart? We're going to talk about an issue. It's an important issue. Dude, please throw in another chord. This is triggering me. And it's something we need to fix. Oh, fucking... What about D? I've work it with the words. It's an important issue. See what that D's doing to your ass? Even though you're rowdy and you're always running wild Holy ducking fuck hunt. It's AIDS random cam. If you're white, That's an offensive you stereotype of a white of boy. Other Some kids don't get rowdy, we just play with plastic toys. Inner city kids privilege. grow up in racial white melting pots. Privilege. And they white get jobs in factory lines kind of and parking lots. So it's somewhat white hypocritical privilege. when this is said by privilege. whites. You've never had a job in their life. Doc, your backup vocals were inspired as usual. But Josh, for fuck's sake, mate. The guitar and lead vocals, they were just... Fuck, what's the word? Gay. Gay. This another verse, another version of this song. You might but there's no structure and each line is twice as long. Beings. To be we honest, I'm just filling time so we don't have to hear you speak. Crack. I'll break it down, Josh. Show us how you shred that major B. Have the SJs taken over San Francisco Bay? And you realize you got no one left to hate. Except your mom and dad and everybody in your state. Don't marry love. Fuck hate. Other than the shade of peach that we call white, which is sort of a misnomer because it's not really peach, but that's. Um, kind of like how we call people black, but really their skin isn't black, black. It's like sort what of- What the fuck are you doing, Josh? Where does white privilege come from? Mm hmm Because whenever I listen to this, all I'm hearing is white people are better. Like, either we're better at coordinating with ourselves to keep everyone else down. Uh, and believe me, if you actually look at history, uh... There isn't an advanced civilization that hasn't engaged in colonialism, dear, regardless of what cl color they were. Seriously, what the fuck are you doing? Oh, you're concentrating, aren't you? <laughs> on, on, on the B major there. I guess Person that it's an ironic choice for you to have perks. the stars and stripes when across you your shirt and a Union Jack like on your strap. Don't I've met some folks who are quite fond of chicken and malt liquor, who don't find that in quite the same ballpark as a swastika. Else. It'd be good. It's a good idea. Shut up! But it's the British Empire brought an end to slavery. While all you cunts you complained about your GDP, we left a trail of booming countries in our wake. Everyone else just builds a church and blocks off trade, so it's somewhat hypocritical. 
but this is said by whites whose memorabilia is made in Shanghai. My biggest privilege is that I got to grow up with my father, bar none. If you want to look at economic benefits, a child who gets to grow up with her father or his father is is gonna is can get themselves out of poverty or maintain um, their economic situation. You take that away, and it's more likely that a child will remain in poverty. So, bar none, my greatest privilege is to grow up with my dad. So guess what, Josh? I am fighting for minorities to have my privilege. Me too. I fight for dad privilege because I know how helpful it is. Happy Rachel. <laughs>
quit being a comedian to become a feminist. Is that That's like the, the most drastic? Is that the most drastic career change? <laughs> it's the funniest thing she's ever done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess when you, I mean, you know, we know feminists aren't funny. So is this Sarah Silverman finding her true calling, or is she just making a really drastic change, or what? Actually, they're hilarious when you piss them off. That would actually, you know what, that, that's pretty funny. If you're a feminist and you want to be a stand-up comedian, you have to actually reverse your entire approach. The way, because comedians, they come out and they talk about their life, and it's a bit self-deprecating. They laugh at themselves. And maybe they'll poke fun at people in the audience. But feminists are completely humorless unless you're trolling them. So a really good feminist comedian would actually be someone who completely, unironically goes up on stage and reacts to other people's behavior. That like she would have to go up there and the audience uses her as a lol cow to milk all the lols out of. That's how you have a good feminist comedy. I'm trying to like this has to be an interactive experience. Like the audience has to essentially do the work, but they get the laughs because she becomes triggered and right. it's all. Yeah, well, you just show up to her uh, act with a T-shirt that says, "I'm raping you right now." <laughs> I'm eye raping you. <laughs> <laughs> some kind of female comedian out there should do some kind of should take on some kind of feminist character and go out and do it at the clubs because it'll drive Poe's Law mad. Loads of people will assume she's real, and she'd be really famous because she'd be funny to the genuine feminists, and she'd be funny to everyone else who's in on the joke. And you saw how far Copper Cab got. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, millions of views, and he's he's fucking tricks eat some fairly smart people sometimes. <laughs> A woman could of course, feminists would accuse him of. Right enough. Feminists would accuse him of cult cultural appropriation. There you go. Like Sarah Silverman is basically she's the Steve Shives of comedy. Essentially, is what it is anyway. So she is the comedy. Yeah, that's an oxymoron. Steve Shives is the critical thinking. So. Yeah, that is the oxymoron. If I've ever heard one. No. Does Sarah Silverman lean in with the yeah? Hmm. You know what I mean? Does she have the Steve Shives lean in? <laughs> I think him and Apatow are both producers on the project. Yeah, I believe that's right. That's why Apatow said that the people in the film were the funniest people on the planet. Yeah, laying it on a little bit thick there, huh? The, the a table. little bit. Only this planet. Yeah, limited to this planet that we know of. All right. But I'm guessing that he's they're probably the funniest people on in the solar system. He could have just said that. They're, they're the funniest the people funniest in that particular movie. Is what it is. Creatures, Somewhere between here and... Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri. Melissa McCarthy, funniest woman between here and Alpha Centauri. For sure. And but looks aren't everything. Oh, damn, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> Real. By the way, Melissa McCarthy being somewhere between here and Alpha Centauri, there is a fat joke there, but I'm not going to tell it. <laughs> yeah, it's too easy. <laughs> it's too indulgent, I think, is the word. You know what, the thing about memes, too, I think I was like, was it Arthur Chu's bit about memes reminded me of there was this game that some social justice warrior made in uh, RPG Maker. And this is the way the social justice warriors think, by the way. But I just got to throw this in there. There was a game that was made by some social justice warrior using an RPG maker. So they didn't really make the game so much as use another product that someone else coded to build their own story that they wanted to tell. And it was all about gamer culture and how toxic it is and sexist towards women it is. And essentially it's there's like a zombie invasion and every person you interact with is like a zombie and they're all saying, you know, they're accusing you of being a fake gamer girl because you're part of a party of girls that I guess are nerds, but they're accusing you of being fake. And they make references to Gamergate, like if you go into the dungeons and the goblins run into you and before the combat starts they'll say actually it's about, you know, ethics and games journalism or hashtag Gamergate. It's really awful. But when they get to the end and you get to the final boss, the final boss explains before you fight that this is a war of memes and that because it's a war of memes and memes can never be destroyed, you can't win. And if you actually have the battle with the boss fight, you can't win. It beats you. And then when it's over, the people in your party are like, well, I guess you can't beat an idea, so there's nothing that can be done. And when I saw that, the only thing I could think of is this is the way they think. They don't believe in what video games are, which is essentially the ability to control outcomes, to take charge and overcome obstacles. They think that ideas are indestructible, which is really stupid. You know how you beat ideas? Do you know how you can destroy them? With better ideas. <laughs> That's how you do it. It's not that hard. 
If you don't like the memes, make better memes. How are we defining non-politically correct or politically incorrect? Because, you know, these days, you could be the Dalai Lama, and you can go on in an interview and say, you know, I think the immigration thing is a mistake. <laughs> and people will say, the Dalai Lama is a shitlord, and he is gross and racist because he has an opinion about immigration. And uh, that would be considered politically incorrect. So now we are to believe that the Dalai Lama is very politically incorrect. Or if what if the Pope went and saw the new Ghostbusters and then made a tweet and said, dude, don't see that shit, man. It's just bunk, <laughs> which I'd love to see, by the way. Would people say that the Pope is politically incorrect? Absolutely. He'd be an MRA at that point. Yeah, he would. <laughs> the Pope <laughs> is an MRA. Sure. He should change that, that, that fucking <laughs> hat. Pope. Into a he's, the, he's the dopest MGTOW ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. It's a MG, MGTOW for life. Oh, yeah, he puts all other MGTOW to shame. <laughs> he's so MGTOW, he fucking runs a religion. You don't even think about bitches. Shit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, how we're using this politically incorrect terminology, like that phrase... It doesn't even have any meaning anymore because these days being PC, un PC just means saying something that other people don't like. It doesn't even like mean anything anymore. It just means having an opinion contrary to somebody else's. I feel better. Example: PC is cowardly, afraid to state that blunt truth for fear of offending someone. That's why Republicans think Obama won't refer to jihadists as radical Islamic terrorists, when in fact it's because he doesn't want to legitimize the idea that they represent Islam. When people blow themselves up or run around shooting up cafes and Christmas parties while saying they are doing this for the name of Islam, well, they're, it's like when they're saying, you know, God is good or whatever, maybe we should be taking them at their word and looking long and hard at the form of Islam that they are talking about, even if we don't like it, to ignore what the people who are doing the killing are actually saying about themselves and their religious beliefs seems to be pretty stupid and worth making fun of to a lot of people, hence the Trump residents. How do you propose to address the problem of the guy who blows himself up thinking he's going to be heading towards 72 virgins without talking about why the promise 72 virgins is wrong? He doesn't represent all of Islam, but he certainly represents his own version of it. Did it ever occur to you that you might be wrong and squelching what people say in the name of political correctness is therefore wrong too? Apparently not. I'm also reminded of when Francesca Ramsey did a show on her MTV Decoded about political correctness, and she referred to how political correctness is expanding the dictionary because it's adding words like microaggressions and mansplaining and, uh, and stuff like that, and therefore that means it's better because we have more words now, even though those are words that are used to sh silence people. That's what I think of when I read this article. And I think inauthentic is probably another word that you use to silence people. If they're not yeah, saying they, the kind of things that you like. She was claiming that uh, political correctness made speech freer because it added words to the dictionary. Yeah, like and mansplaining and and, 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 it, and it all turned out to be words that were used as thought terminating cliches basically to shut people up, yeah. People from the groups that are considered privileged. It's to silence the privileged and give voices to the voiceless, according to her. Even though the voiceless seem to have voices all over the place. Uhuru, y'all! But, um, <laughs> oh, God. you know, something else that hit me from this is the example of Obama and Islam. Our country, our government is supposed to be not either religious or secular. It is supposed to be outside of both, not imposing either one, not defining either one. And it's fundamental to our constitution that the state doesn't define or protect or do anything to the church. And here we have our president singling out one religion to protect its PR from its black sheep. And I think it's related because this is more sort of rhetoric that's designed to support the narrative boogeyman around people like, not just Donald Trump himself, but it's going to get to the point where you can just say, oh, well, Milo Yiannopoulos is a Trump supporter, therefore we don't have to listen to him, a.k.a. Judd Apatow, right? And this is to sort of like further reinforce that narrative so that you can execute guilt by association to shut people up.
the basics of a human right would be you have the right to seek to feed yourself. You have the right to seek to provide for yourself. And there are people who consider being provided for a right, even if you didn't go out and earn it. And there are people who consider having as much of a right as seeking, as pursuing. And it depends on where those definitions come from, where those, where those attitudes come from. And then you also have, like, one of the big conflicts between people who seek something along the lines of egalitarianism, you know, people whose attitudes are more egalitarian, because there's, I, I don't think there are very many people who are true egalitarians, because in order to be a true egalitarian, you have to deny some things in biology that are just fact. But to have at least a legal egalitarianism as far as legal entitlements and legal obligations versus, say, people who want to continue the gynocentric attitude towards society where women are not considered violent when they do things that are considered violent when men do them and, and where women's welfare is more important in a conflict between a woman and a man. That conflict is going to be a very difficult one to settle because people who are gynocentric to the extent where they don't see it as violent when a woman hits a man or where they think of women as being entitled to be venerated, to be pedestalized, where women shouldn't have to face the same moral and ethical obligations as a man, they're very blind to that. And when you start talking about holding women equally accountable to them, you're talking about hurting women. You're hating on women. You're actually a misogynist for considering a woman not entitled to defend herself against being offended using a violent act. And it's going to take a change of mentality among people toward women before those issues can actually be dealt with on a large scale. Because you're going to have to overcome the hurdle of people resisting changing the law in ways that would not accommodate their sense of protecting women's welfare. Comprising strip after strip of anti-SJW caricatures, Gamergate life obviously fits Day's ideology. I have also heard it suggested that he chose Aaron Dies Alone as a dig at Alexandra Aaron, who wrote a short ebook spoofing him. Beyond this, it's hard to discern the exact criteria behind his choices. One of the comics, Gunner Creek Court, proved controversial within Day's comment section. Gunner Creek Court recently gave us not one, but two big, fat, awful, in-your-face gay lesbian subplots involving the main characters, no less. So I personally wouldn't feel comfortable recommending it anywhere these days, wrote one poster. Okay, before we move on, it says that Gamergate Life has anti-SJW caricatures. Have you guys ever seen the Gamergate Life comics? Yeah, the, like, yeah the, on the occasion. The real ones? Yeah, on occasion. Would you consider those to be caricatures? Uh, I don't know that I've seen enough of them to form an opinion, honestly. Social okay. justice warriors are kind of hard to caricature because they can be so exaggerated in real life. How do you exaggerate further? When something is already hyperbolic, where do you go from there? How do you create a hyperbolic spoof of, say, Trigglypuff or Big Red? How do you get more <laughs> exaggerated than them? How do you exaggerate that? I don't understand. Where do you go from nuclear? Does the comic blow up in your face? You yeah, know, no, I, not that I don't read it regularly. I do, but like, honest to God, no, they're not caricatures. You can't caricature something that is a caricature of itself. Yeah, all he does is really, in most of them, he just puts out what happened that week, and he manages to come up with their shit happening so often that he has enough material to do something multiple times a week if he wants to. Yeah, I am confused about one thing, though. Is the category comics or webcomics? Webcomics. Okay, so why was there a complaint, then, in the article about the category consisting entirely of online strips? What was the... Do you mean the fact that it, it existed as a category? Yeah, it sounded like the writer was complaining that all the strips were from online. Maybe yeah, I misunderstood they... that it was not a complaint, it was just a statement, but it really did. It sounded like, category entirely of online strips, you know, as a complaint. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, what else would be put in a webcomics category? Yeah, I mean, there is a... Okay, so I'll go back and read the bit that I think you're thinking about. Think... They say, after a reasonably strong set of graphic novels, the best graphic story category starts to go downhill when we arrive at the webcomics. 
So this person already has a low opinion of web comics, apparently. Or they're saying that because Gamergate Life made it in as part of the category, that's where the downhill slope begins. Because the stuff before it, when it was all about a Che Guevara-like revolution or this guy who is hanging out in Burma learning about how bigoted Americans are, that was totally cool because it's the kind of stories this person likes to see. But when it was like Gamergate Life, which is really just poking fun at behavior that people actually engaged in, this wasn't exaggerated, at least not that much, because there's not much to exaggerate. It's there. Then yeah, she they, has they a problem oh, going downhill. I think they were just taking exception to the content, basically, more than anything else. Not the category, the content of the categories. It's like, yeah, oh, wait, here's the, thing. Yeah, here's the thing that I don't like, and so I have a problem with it now. It's like, but all this other stuff that I do like is okay, but the stuff I don't like, no, we can't have that because people can't do other things that I don't like. Yeah, the stuff that uh, Kukurio is basically parodying and, or making fun of in his comic strips, I mean, they're giving him material. He's just putting it up there. That's all he's doing. Before I finish this, I want to describe the picture. There's the actual description of the picture, which was a commission that was done for Kukurio by someone else. And then he usually puts his stuff up on his website. And it's Kamala Khan, or AKA the new Ms. Marvel, which, by the way, is one of those darlings of comics that feminists absolutely adore. Therefore, you are not allowed to make art of her. It's like Steven Universe people daring to draw those characters as thin. Do not do it. But anyway, he did her, and essentially, she's just standing in a pose with one hand on her hip and the other one up in the air, and it's kind of like from the back. She's turning her head over her shoulder and smiling at us, and she's got no pants on. And that's it. Or does and she have flesh tone pants? It's a, it's what? Or does she have flesh tone pants? No, 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 no. <laughs> There's no pants. You can see okay. the he, he draws a clam in there, but oh god. <laughs> but the thing is, though, it's not really pornographic. See, this person's calling it a pornographic image because you have to look at the way that they're using the words, okay? A pornographic image of the Marvel Comics heroine, Kamala Ms. Marvel Khan, whose canonical age is 16. So, there's a lot wrapped up in this sentence. One, yeah. the statement is it's pornographic. It's not. She's nude from the waist down. The second part of it is canonical age is 16. All right? Well, in the comics, she is. However, according to Ku, what he was commissioned for was to draw her as though she was older. Now, this could have been to cover his own ass. That's entirely possible. However, it's a drawing of a woman, and it was done for somebody who wanted it. But Phil Sandifier, or Sandifer, a vocal opponent of Vox Day and the Puppy Campaigns, ran a blog post about Cucurio's drawing. His choice of title was uncompromising. Vox Day put a child pornographer on the Hugo ballot. That's what he called it. So now we're looking at Cucurio being accused of being a pedophile because he drew a fictional character who in the canon of her fiction is 16 years old, although he did it as a commission for someone else, and according to Ku, she's supposed to be like 22 or something in his version of it. That's what he says. Again, can you prove him wrong? Like, I don't know where you can go from here with that. It's a drawing of a person who looks developed. That's all, so you, that's all you got. pointing out that kids grow up is now pedophilia. Yeah, and by the way... So they're now trying to water down pedophilia. I hereby officially accuse that writer of attempting to water down what pedophilia is to make it easier to justify actual pedophilia. Yeah, and it's and really I'm just... not kidding. I'm serious. They did the same thing with rapes. They're watering down rape, and it's gotten to the point now where they're saying all heterosexual sex is rape. Feminists and social justice warriors are treating all heterosexual sex as rape. And one of the potential consequences of that could be that when rape actually happens, it'll be taken less seriously because, well, people say that about all heterosexual sex is no big deal. Treating a subject like this that lightly is absolutely atrocious. I mean, do I get to declare, for instance, that all pictures of me are off limits because I was 16 once? Or is it only fictional characters that you can do that with? You can't have a fictional character portrayed as an adult because the fictional character is thought of as being 16? You know, it's ridiculous. Stretching to make an accusation like that. It's outright ridiculous and it actually is atrocious 
Because it, and, and it wouldn't actually be... Well, there's another word for it, especially yeah. considering the fact that in a lot of places, in, including where I live, the legal age of consent for sex is 16. So yeah, 16 thinking, is not... It, hell, in, in some countries, it's considered adulthood. You're a responsible... Especially for men, you're considered a responsible adult. In some countries, 16 is well beyond the age at which you can have a bomb strapped to your chest and be sent into a building to blow up. It's well beyond the age at which you can have a gun shoved into your hands and be told you're now in the military. So here we are talking about an age for a fictional character, no less, one who is capable of taking on huge amounts of responsibility because she is a superhero. And we're reacting to that the same as we would somebody taking advantage of a five-year-old. I'm we're sorry, that's just to. that's sick. That is a sick attitude and a sick thing to do. All right, so there are people that are in the chat that are saying that, yes, anti-gamer gay is pro-pedophile. And I don't know for sure that that's true. My belief comes from this. They're protecting people who are admitted pedophiles, but they're not doing it because they believe in what those people are doing. They're doing it because those people are on their side. Because if they found that there were pedophiles that were in Gamergate, they would expose them as bad people as soon as possible. I don't think it's about yeah. their moral stance on pedophilia. I think it's about who is the enemy and who is the ally. And we'll protect our allies no matter what they do because we want allies. And we'll throw our enemies under the bus no matter what they do because they're the enemy. That's why I don't think that they're necessarily pro or anti-pedophilia. I think that it really comes down to this is our friend, we protect our friend. This is our enemy, we go after our enemy. Because if they were pro-pedophile, they wouldn't be trying to accuse Ku of being a pedophile right now. They would instead either ignore it, dismiss it, diminish it, or say, you know, you shouldn't go after him for those reasons. You should go after him for these reasons. Instead, they're using it as a weapon against him. So this means that their feeling about it is irrelevant to essentially their decision about whether or not you're one of them or you're one of the other. And then that frames their whole view on you is framed around whether or not you're their friend or not. That's why I say that. And what that really makes them is hypocrites complete and utter hypocrites. It basically says that any moral judgment that they proclaim is bullshit because they wouldn't make the same judgment if it was somebody on their side. I encourage you guys that are listening to this, if you can think of a movie from like the 70s or 80s, or maybe even the 90s, although I don't think there are as many because 90s got pretty PC. It's supposed to um, with song lyrics as well. Like oh, Jim, yeah. Mar Jim Morrison famously, famously got in trouble for singing Girl We Couldn't Get Much Higher. Because that wasn't allowed in the 60s, to even say the word higher in a way that might mean drugs. You'd get away with it now. However, show me the way to the next little girl, <laughs> and before you slip into unconsciousness, I'd like to uh, have another kiss. Now, that would get him thrown in jail before he'd even publish the song. Oh, yeah. Along with, uh, I know you want it, because you're a good girl. <laughs> um, that wouldn't... <laughs> <laughs> that already was like a shit song. Yeah, they freaked out over that. That uh, that was bad. A song that portrays the woman is the one with the power. It says, you know, you come get me. It's up to you. Your decision. Your choice. I know that's what you want to do. Come and do it. You know, basically come at me. That offends them. Treating women like little girls. Treating women like children. That doesn't offend them. But treating women as adults with agency does. Yeah. Even that if they're fictional. That is a sickness of the mind. When treating women as adults with agency upsets you, and you're only not upset if female equals helpless little girl. That is a sickness of the mind, and you need help. Now we have Ranzerger number 61, where we harass, I mean criticize, Anita Sarkeesian by refuting her bad arguments regarding... Ones and zeros that some people might find sexy. So there's going to be no bullshit today. None. No talking about kids. No screaming, dog, I kill you. No wittering. We go right into it. And everybody's silent, so that's good. No, that, just... that seems to be, I mean, that doesn't seem to be directed at me, so. Okay, good. Well, You're no. not the dog we were talking about. Shut up, dog. No. I'm just brushing my teeth, so just like. Oh, for fuck's <laughs> Right, small Thank you, Karen. That was all your silliness. Let's go. That's, yeah, that's your entire silliness quotient for the day. Your silliness quotient has increased from six ounces to four ounces. Apart from this bit about silliness quotients, that's also part of your silliness quotient. It's so meta.
Oh my fucking god. Are we okay? That's it. All right, let's do this. Because we still got 16 minutes of this shit to go through. So. Amazing. My god, look at that. Good night, Ooh, that's definitely stimulating my economy. <laughs> is, it, is it just me? Is it just me? Or when the chick said, "Oh my god, look at that," it wasn't in an admiring way. It was like, "Oh my god, what a fucking slut." Yeah. Oh. Uh. You know what I love? This? These are freebies for Anita. Like, she can show this shit, and she can get the clicks that this shit will get, but she doesn't have to take responsibility for it. She doesn't have to take responsibility for exploiting female sexuality for clicks. If you can really say, call it exploiting. I guess, technically, it is exploiting. Lingerie is not armor. Depends. Depends is also Dep not armor. It's... No, it depends on what you're... The dull diapers. Depends on what you're fighting. Yeah, I got the joke, but it depends on what you're fighting. I mean, the joke? Like... I don't know. Okay. Well, you know. well, what's the male equivalent of lingerie? Armor. Uh, we we went through right. this fucking several feminist frequency episodes ago. The equivalent of women dressing up in lingerie to please men. The male equivalent of that is fucking dressing up in armor and killing other men to please women. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's like literally it's sort of that Viking uniform of like sort of the bare chest and uh, maybe some like really really awesome tattoos or something like that. Like that kind of the God of War thing, right? That's a male character I could fucking get behind. Or, um... You know, <laughs> well, or also... In front of, or, you know, climb like a fire pole. You know what? Uh, to use a reference that will make everyone groan... Hold um, it, fire? Yes, of course. You can't um, climb him like a fire pole. He's not shaped like a fire pole. I'll just leave that hanging. I wasn't going to... What, can you guys well, just... My his pole is shaped like a fire pole, and I'd climb... Okay, what, that, that's not where I was going with this. Can I just go where I'm going, and then you guys can jump on and... No. No. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That seems not bad. We yeah. had, like, hairy shoulders and everything. Yeah, but that's, you know, that's not too bad. I mean, it's... It's, it, it's not it's not drawn to be aesthetically really titillating. You could have Jimon Hunsu from Blood Diamond and Gladiator and all those movies... You could have him come in here and do this, or Jason Statham, and it would be fucking hot. Be fucking, fucking hot. Holy shit. I, but here's, I think... here's the here's the punchline, because this is the fun one. During those scenes, he was actually, you know, he looked taller, he looked more groomed. Now he just looks like a freaking, like, like you said, a muscular George Costanza. He's a George fucking Costanza with... Most but that, that's the punchline. Like, they're turning this guy into a joke. A character's clothing is one of the first things we notice. It's an important part of our first impression of who that character is. And as such, it's a way for designers to immediately communicate to players what is most important and noteworthy about them. I think that right. the first thing we notice is whether or not the game sucks. Yeah, probably. And I'm just doing this for the banana. And also because it's a natural uh, pause. Female heroes in video games might be special agents or soldiers or treasure hunters by trade. They often find themselves in dangerous, physically demanding situations, fighting off bad guys and saving the world. They are typically performing activities that call for practical or protective clothing. But when we look at the types of outfits that female characters are made to wear, we can... Made to wear. <laughs> well, they are because they're female characters and they don't have any... Yeah, the men are also made to wear in... Like, it's an absolutely ridiculous statement when you're talking about a character that somebody anybody has designed. Remember, anybody remember Turok? Huh? Yeah. yeah. Turok Dinosaur Hunter. Wasn't he wandering around in a loincloth and those kind of... those weird leggings that some Plains natives used to wear or uh, sort of... Uh, no, not Plains natives. You know, like, he, he was walking around with no shirt on, his chest bare, shooting dinosaurs with arrows and shit. And uh, yeah. his body was on display... You have to wonder how often... He died because, or when he came back to life. It was when he came back to life and he was like, oh, I am Turok, and he like rose up and his, like, his back was all arched. And it was like, oh yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> you have to wonder how many times they do games like Turok where, where, it's, where it's not from eye view, it's from just behind the character. So you're constantly following a half-naked dude and looking at his ass. How many times that makes it to the testing stage, and it gets lots of people saying, "Ah, oh, I'm sick of staring at this guy's ass. I feel gay." <laughs> so they change it by the time it gets to the publishing stage. So people complain when there's half-naked men, but then when they do it with women, no one complains. So who's being discriminated against here? Fictional male characters, it would seem. <laughs> it's I'm, just, I'm not bothered by that. But Anita, you got it upside down again. Yeah, that's like it comes back to my original question: Is the problem that we do it to women, or that we don't do it to men? In my opinion. I think we should have more expression. Bring on the half-naked man-ass. 
More ass, not less. It's a good thing this isn't meant to be realistic in a game where you're fighting with magic swords and you're fighting against the undead and demons and stuff. Well, let's not, uh, you know, get too crazy with the fashion because we don't want to be too far off the mark in terms of realism. Yeah, you know, for all it, we know, she could be wearing, like, invisible armor. We don't know anything. I'll, the thing is, that's the thing. If, if Anita was the one that we got that, that got to decide what is considered practical, because feminists are always doing this shit. They do it in comic books, they do it in film, they do it in video games. They're always thinking that the armor has to be practical, and they only do it when it comes to the women. And the fact is, if we were to try to figure out what it is they wanted, everyone would look the same, and it would be boring as shit. This is artistic license. Yes, Ivy is intended to be sexy. Ivy, the character, sees herself that way, too. That's part of her appeal. But it's not actually fair, as in the same fucking game, there's a woman named Brunhild that wears a full head-to-toe plate armor because that is her character type. And so she's cherry-picking here. Now, of course, Ivy is the obvious one because they always go with this because she's voluptuous and she doesn't wear much and she shows skin and her personality is kind of like a dominatrix thing. So they did a little bit of that in the costume design and everything else. But they're doing it for artistic appeal. But Brunhild is the knight and she has a spear and a shield and she's completely clothed, well, not just clothed, but armored from head to toe. But Anita's not going to talk about that because she's more interested in cherry-picking these in individual instances. What I saw was she was basically sodomizing her enemy with her heel. And Anita has a problem with how that's portraying Bayonetta. Okay, all right, I'm just going to walk away from that one. I think you're completely fucked, Anita. Tags literally leave her naked because, you see, she's attacking the enemies with her hair, and her hair is also her clothing. So when she's using her hair to attack her enemies, it can't be covering her body, and... Well, that's a dip shit. right. You just completely glossed over someone being sodomized with a heel to focus on someone's hair being a weapon. Male disposability right there. And a really disturbing kind. And I'm not going to say that you can't do that. Bayonetta can't do that. I'm just saying. It's really fucked up when you could watch that and focus on the woman being exploited versus her enemy being raped to death. I'm just saying. I'm just putting it out there. I'm putting it out there that Anita needs to spend some time in a sex dungeon. <sighs> what are you nodding for? Why are you nodding sagely? Nothing you've said is sage. In these ways, the game deliberately links Bayonetta's sexuality to power, selling a version of sexual objectification that we're all supposed to feel good about and find empowering. Every aspect of Bayonetta's existence... I actually don't find the sodomy good. I don't feel good about that, but... I mean, I guess it's really black humor. I want to know Anita's opinion on Gone Girl. Is she going to say, why did she have to be almost naked in that famous scene where she cut the guy's throat? Yeah, because obviously the nudity of the killer is the real problem. He's a, you know, Patrick Bateman, his, uh, well, alleged reign of sociopathy, that's that's not the problem. The problem is that he's naked in a lot of the movie, because that's objectifying. You're right, this doesn't even, don't nod sagely, you, you have no sageness to you. From the way the camera is magnetically drawn to her sexualized body parts, to the pole dance reward for completing the game, is expertly designed to be sexually affirming and satisfying for a presumed straight male audience. Being sodomized. To death with someone's heel is sexually affirming for the straight male audience. Can a straight woman enjoy this game? I don't know. Does the sodomy have to be to the death, or can it just be like, you know, most of the way there? To the to pain. The, to the pain. <laughs> I could probably get into that. But you're not straight, so you can't oh, be asked. Right. Well, none of us really could be asked that question. I'm just, I'm still stuck on the sodomy and the fact that she just presented that and she just never, ever remarked on it. I'm actually astounded that straight guys, I guess, I don't know, like, how do you watch that? And you're like, yeah, okay. She's sodomizing a guy to death. That's okay. I'm okay with that. Well, the thing is, when us gamers play these things, we realize that nothing actually is happening and that it's just zeros and ones interacting with yeah. each other. And then we just sort of take it, we just enjoy the pixels and their beautiful dance of death. And that's yeah. it. It's just a means to an end. Whether she's stomping out somebody's asshole or it's somebody getting like stabbed through the back with a sword or if it's somebody that's getting shot 360 no-scope headshot, none of it matters to us. All we care about is, is this fun to play? Yes. Cool. No. Okay. 
I'm not buying it. Women can't be powerful and sexy. Feminists tell us that. Whenever a woman is sexy, she's solely a sex object. Feminists tell us everybody else does that, except it seems more like feminists are the ones who do that. This is a great derp face. How is a woman supposed to look powerful without looking sexy? I assume that she would have to look like a man. It's much the same with a man. With the more powerful a man looks, the more sexy he looks, unless you go over the top with the, you know what I mean. But it's the same thing. If a woman looks sort of small and dowdy and dressed in a garbage bag, then she doesn't look powerful. Oh, if but, she, yeah, you actually got a good point. Violent, then, if, if, you know, these powerful and sexy are not just different kinds of each other. They go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah but there, it, are women, there are women like Brienne of Tarth in Game of Thrones who don't look sexy but do look powerful. I mean, like, she did look sexy when she was stepping into that hot tub, but, you know, in her armor, she doesn't look sexy. She looks powerful. Madeleine Albright doesn't look sexy. She looks powerful. Margaret Thatcher didn't look sexy. She looked powerful. If the Pope um, doesn't look sexy, he looks powerful. I think what uh, Barnum McCam is not saying that it's an absolute law that sexy is, you know, powerful is sexy. He's saying that it's really hard to look powerless. and Like, there's a middle ground. There's a bell curve. At some point, you stop having that sort of primal, I can get shit done, yeah, you, sexiness. You can, look, you can look powerful without looking sexy, but it's hard to look sexy without looking powerful. Yeah, and right? I, I get what he's saying, because if you look even yeah. at just high heels, high heels are fucking intimidating. They make you tall, they make the sound, and they're based on technology of war. So it's like they make you look intimidating, they make you look powerful, they make you look like someone I don't need to walk around, I got other people who can walk for me. And all the clothing and the war paint and the jewelry, and times past, that shit would be reserved for the powerful. Yep. So women get the accoutrement of like Bronze Age aristocracy. They're basically wandering around looking like Bronze Age aristocracy. I will say this. The guy that was trying to explain why Cortana was naked, I would have said two things to it. One, she's not naked. She's a computer program. So you don't, because once you, like, if they frame the question like this, if they said, hey, why is Cortana naked in this game? That is a leading question that presumes that the character is naked. So first, you, re you cut them off of the past. If you don't feel that she is, you say, she isn't naked. Show me where her lips are at and show me where her nipples are at. Or you say, fuck you because I want to. That's why. Yeah. You don't have to give them an answer to that question. That is because it's not important. That's my answer. If you ask me why I did something a certain way, I say, fuck you because I wanted to. That's why. Okay. In fact... If the uh, developer of the game Dragon's Crown was approached with the same thing, where they said, why did you make the sorceress so uh, busty and the Amazon have such a big ass or whatever, and they broke wearing so little clothing, and he responded in a way that is precious to me, where he said, well, if you're into dwarves, here's a bunch of shirtless dwarf images. That was basically his way of saying, fuck you, I want it to, that's why. I don't need a reason. <laughs> Let's imagine, yeah. okay, all right, so we got some scenarios here. we got the male character, and he walks into a bar. And let's imagine he has to do something in order to attract a woman at the bar. That's wrong, because then she's a reward. Let's say he has to walk up to her and talk to her to get to know her, and then they have sex. Well, that's wrong, because it's also a situation where it's a reward. But if he walks into the bar, and the female character hits on him and says, let's go have sex, that's also wrong, because the creator is forcing her to do that. She doesn't have any consent in the matter. So essentially what Anita is arguing is that we shouldn't have sex in games at all. I wonder what the end game of this is. Uh, white, straight men suck. And all, any desires they may have are bad, period. Okay, but the end game is just basically purging games of all sexual content except for lesbians. Because if that woman with well, the guy who's a oh, gamer... As long as the lesbians are 14-year-old girls, and yes, because yeah, it, they have to be, <laughs> because if they're like really hot lipstick lesbians, that can also be interpreted as something that is to titillate men. So you can't oh, yes. have that either. She wants a world where women learn about their identity and even their sexual identity from other sort of unsexually dressed girls in their dormitory or something. And the only time they ever encounter men is when some big shot man comes to town to do some fucking in the event. Oh shit, it's the Hamay's Tale. Next we look at the people who are out in the world and are trying to make a real difference with Honey Badger Radio number 58, Advocacy to Activism number 2. How did the stories between men and women, like the stories that they were telling you and getting, I, I suppose, you listening to and giving advice about, how did they differ? Do you mind if I ask that? Um, no, I don't mind at all. I think women were, it was all about me, 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 
and he must do this to help me and, and he must do this to change for me and why won't he do this and why won't he do that. And there's a barrier with women where they stop when it gets too painful. And you know, in, in my coaching I often say to people, you don't stop where it hurts, you have to go to where it bleeds. You know, if you want to get to the source of something, you've got to really do the inner work. And I've found that women have a real barrier there. You know, they're not really prepared to go that extra yard inside to kind of look at where the root of the problem is. And most of it's projection. You know, I don't mind saying as well, it was all around the same time as my own marriage breakdown. And, you know, I had a bit of an epiphany one day and I realised that I had done the same thing to my husband. You know, I had asked him to change over and over and over again and you know I needed him to be more of this and less of that and you know all of this kind of stuff and I just had the blinding wake up call one day of what I had done to this beautiful man and it was just it was wrong you know it was just it was wrong there was nothing any more wrong with him than was wrong with me and the only thing I had control over was changing myself and so that's what I did I'll just sorry add on to that because you asked me about men the, the difference I find with men although it is still challenging to get anyone to go to the real source of the pain. But the difference I find about men is that they tend to be more open to accept their role, they accept their part, and they tend to be more open to wanting to address the issues but, you know, just move forward so that they can repair and move on. Women tend to want to stay stuck in that kind of victim place. That's actually my experience with men and women too, is that when it comes to... Uh you know, the, the women that I've tried to help through a situation, it really is often, you know, why doesn't he do this? Why doesn't he do that? I don't know why he does this. I don't know why he does that. I need him to do this, that, and the other. And with men, it's much more, what do I have to do to fix this? What do I have to do to make her happy? And so it's almost like there's this huge imbalance in, in terms of taking responsibility. I think men often take too much, and women just kind of sidestep it and try and offload all of it onto the man as well. I actually have a really quick question before um, we go into audience comments. What do you think it is about yourself that makes you, because there's a lot of women who seem to be very unable to actually witness or deal with male vulnerability. What do you think it is about yourself that allows you to manage that kind of thing and uh, not run away screaming? which just seems to be a very common reaction among women. Screaming or shaming? That's a really good question. My answer to that is that I don't see it as any other way and I never have seen it as any other way. I've always been this way and I've always, even as a teenager, my best friends were, the friends that I could rely on the most were always men. They were always guys my age and some of them I'm still very, very close friends with now. To me it's a human problem. I think that because I have experienced and from a young age the ugly side of both genders that I see it as a human issue. I don't see things as a gender issue. And in terms of vulnerability, I don't know, maybe shared stories from a young age and being prepared to listen. And I suppose that's where, you know, I really object to the feminism being taught in schools because what they're teaching young women is that men's stories don't matter. And, you know, I think that time, you know, my teenage years were pretty tough for me. And I think that was probably when I was most open to developing the mindset that I have now and I, I'm terrified to think that our schools are indoctrinating young girls to speak over the top of boys and for boys to be silenced in that process. I went through a domestic violence situation that lasted about a year and I almost died. And uh, then I went to go get help and I was told that an abuse counselor here in Halifax only helps women who are victims and they would point men towards uh, anger management. That was really disappointing. I ran into this social worker named Robert Wright, and he works with male victims of sexual violence, and he had a peer support group. So I just said, hey, what about doing a peer support group for men who had experienced domestic violence? This was April of 2013. So we did all this work for about two years. It took forever to get this on the go. And I finally, with him and another social worker, got the uh, a local mental health nonprofit to donate to grant it's a grant uh, $6,500 to start a peer support group for male victims of domestic violence so that's when I got in touch with Justin because I said hey we're doing this work here or at least I am with these two uh, social workers and I thought he'd be interested so that's where that started basically I'm, I'm just amazed 
got a grant. Yeah, and we lost it, which is another oh. story completely. <laughs> I'll tell you what happened. Can I tell you the story real quick? Yeah, sure. go ahead. Okay, because this, this is terrible. You guys are going to hate this so much. This almost killed me. It ripped my heart out. and It just broke my heart. Basically, Robert got an intern to start writing this grant with me, and I got a community organization called Veth House. The director at the time was really into this idea. She was my therapist, actually, for a year and a half. So she loved this idea. He loved the idea. They worked together because he has a private practice, you know, as a therapist, and she was working as a therapist in a community place. So they thought they'd join together and help men who experienced domestic violence. And then I was like the in-between, and I suppose in a sense sort of the poster boy for it. They were kind of like, look, there is one, right? And uh, so we got this grant for $6,500. They gave it to the community place just at the same time that the director who was working with me had to leave. So she left and left it in charge of the new director. I called and said, hey, how's it going with this you know, peer support group? And she told me, well, you know what? I've got some bad news. You're not going to like to hear this. We're not doing it. And I said, why? And she said, well, I'm not a therapist and I'm not into this issue at all. This is, under my direction, this is going to be more of a community place. And I, I, I didn't know what to say. She wanted to take that $6,500 and turn it into a community kitchen. So basically, one person, after three years of work, killed all the work of uh, all these people and uh, destroyed that. But here's the happy story. Cafe Halifax, with Robert Wright, we've started our own peer support group from the ground up. I One of the members is uh, David McGinnis. He's an absolutely brilliant therapist and practitioner of neuro-linguistic pro programming. And he's helping to facilitate this group. And we are starting it this month. So I'm really excited about that. It'll just be a little bit more from the ground up. Isn't her taking that $6,500 that was a grant specific yeah. for a support group, wasn't her taking that a misappropriation of funds? Shouldn't no, she, she sorry, she wanted to take it. She tried to take oh. it, but they forced her to give it back. <laughs> so oh. we rewrote the grant and tried to get it again, but a different board voted on it, and they uh, decided against it this time, so we're doing it on our own. Oh, for fuck's sake. I know. <laughs> I know. You should have heard me, Karen. Oh, God, it was awful. Oddly enough, or perhaps not, so oddly, now that I think about it. It was seeming to come from these specific women, or the main offence seems to be, but then the people acting out that sort of discontent were really people who were within the organisation or had joined the organisation but saw its purpose really only for either men to make stuff to benefit other people or pretty much just turning it only into local Lions Club or a local Rotary Club. And I don't at all denigrate the work of those organisations. They do great work. It's just that I really think if, if somebody wants to start any of those clubs, well, go actually do that. Um, well, and those, you know, I think, those, clubs are, those clubs are for men who are not in crisis or not having problems that they need help with to help other people. That, that's what the Rotary Club is for. It's not a place for men who are having difficulties to find some kind of help with that. Those are charitable organizations. Like This is a charitable organization for men, not a charitable organization by men. Exactly other people like what the it literally is this like if men are vulnerable or men are angry then who's actually keeping the lights on and the water running that's what I want to know so let's just plaster over all of their emotions and put them back to work that seems pretty much to be the attitude <laughs> unfortunately. okay Jasmine get in there and get your thoughts Right, sorry, I was muted. First of all, it's nice to have another Aussie here. It's a difficult thing, like the CWA in particular, and not unlike Rotary, I mean, CWA, from my knowledge, was founded on country women coming together and being able to network and being a support for women. And it was as much, I mean, I remember going to the CWA hall here as a little child and, you know, all the women were cooking and doing things and talking and sharing their stories. And, you know, in that essence, women were working alongside each other and supporting each other and supporting the community. Most of what they did was for the good of the community. For them to deny that opportunity for men, I think, is quite abhorrent. When it comes to 
men's sheds here in Canberra, there was a bit of a debate just recently that because women are wanting to join into men's shed because they see it as a therapeutic situation and they don't want to be denied access to something that's working for men. And I personally am against that. I think men's shed is one of the few things that actually works really well for men. It's one of the few things that we do. It's probably the only thing that we do in Australia in their own space and, and work alongside each other and it is very much that philosophy of working shoulder to shoulder. I think the the broader issue here is just the denial of being able to appreciate and respect that for women and absolutely ban it for men. And Keith, I can understand your struggle. If it's one person in that organisation that's against it, they're going to have a very vocal voice and they're going to be very dogmatic and dictatorial and they're, they're not going to allow anything to be spoken about. But I applaud you for even giving it a shot. Yeah, I definitely still intend to set something up in the local area. I've just got to look at some other way to get some sort of base funding because there's the men's sheds. I could still just go start another one down the road if need be and the funding is available up to $60,000 but I've got to find at least a third of that myself which is basically the question at hand. Where in the world would I find that kind of money? Good grief. And then, and then they're like, why don't you do anything? Like, why don't you MRAs actually do any activism? Why don't you ever do anything to actually help men? That's the new feminist criticism of MRAs. It used to be, you just want to hurt women. Now it's like, well, all you do is complain about feminism. You don't actually do anything to help men. Well, you know, I was literally amazed. I was blown away that Mel was able to get $6,500 from the system. That is like more than any other men's group has ever gotten from a bureaucracy in this country. Earl Silverman, who ran a domestic violence shelter for two years and a crisis line for 20 years for men, got a single one-time grant of $800. That's all he got out of the government. And everything else was out of his own pocket and through private donations. And I was amazed. It was like a miracle. $6,500, Mel. $6,500, and then it got taken away. But that's the kind of budget that we're working with. Meanwhile, the average director of a domestic violence shelter for women in Alberta is $157,000 a year. That's her salary. I had the idea for this, let's see, about four years ago, after I got out of my relationship, I was in big trouble. I mean, I was all over the place. I went into a terrible downward spiral. I had massive PTSD and anxiety and depression and for some strange reason complicated grief and I was trying desperately to get some help and when I had that experience of being told actually at this office we can't help you. Sorry buddy you're on your own. It killed me you know so I just don't want anybody else to have to go through that. I just can't stand it. I can't stand the idea right? So I think that's really where, I don't know if you can call it activism or advocacy, but that's, for me, it's like, okay, let me give you an example. I've been talking to victim services for a long time, and uh, the head of victim services, Dr. Brona Singer, is wonderful. She told me the 10-year average of people who call in for domestic violence complaints over that 10 years, and this is in Halifax, which is a city of about 300,000, 65% on average who call into victim services are women, and 35% are men. That translates to between 11 and 1,200 men per year who are picking up the phone to call victim services and then wind up with no resources, no counselors, no help. Sometimes they're laughed at. Sometimes they're ignored. Or they're blamed. <laughs> or they're blamed. Or at worst, they're arrested. At worst, yeah. they're arrested after they get attacked. So that's a massive amount of people. That's one city, 11 to 1,200 men calling. That's just the city. Just imagine how many men there are across Canada and then picture it around the world. This is a huge problem. And what I'm trying to do is make sure that we have to have all hands on deck to solve the problem of domestic violence. And you cannot do that if you're only looking at a certain portion of it and only helping a small portion of those people who are experiencing it. So how do we make that change? I think video is incredibly powerful. I think there is nothing more powerful I could possibly do to get this on the go. So I just wanted to get the word out there, which is 
fantastic about this that we are working really hard. The guys at Cafe are helping, and we have started to look at it as a broader project. The documentary is going to launch. There's a Facebook group called Male Tears No More on Facebook, and uh, that's an open group for people to come share their stories because I want to expand the narrative space on domestic violence by giving a bigger place for uh, men to share their stories. And by having this Facebook group, that's one extension. We're put, setting up a Twitter account at MailTearsNoMore.com. We're doing a, a website, a full-on website. And, of course, we're doing the documentary. So it's all integrated. And I hope it expands out into bringing this into the broader consciousness. Because what you have to do is you have to plant a seed and make that change happen. So, basically, I want to encourage men to come forward and tell their stories and know that it's okay that they're not alone. And um, I was really surprised, and I know this is going to sound silly of me to say, but a lot of people have said, oh, man, it's so courageous of you to tell your story, like when I do talk about the horrible violence that happened to me and what it was like. And I'm like, no, it's not that courageous. I was fucking desperate. I was like, it'll fix me. <laughs> and I just couldn't stop talking about it because I was so fucked up. So I guess I realized that all the men and women that I've talked to ever about domestic violence, anybody who's ever experienced it, they always get it as soon as you talk about it in a realistic way and in a way that expresses, man, I've been there. Well, here's the thing, Karen and everybody else, actually. Imagine trying to make a film. And then imagine trying to make a film that nobody wants you to make. I started off by getting a videographer, and he was all over the idea. Like, man, this is a story that has to be told. This is going to make such a difference. And then he bailed. Then I got another one. Same deal. He bailed. I got a third one. Same deal. He bailed. And I finally asked the third guy, why? And he said, dude, listen, as soon as I started talking to the people in the film industry around here, this could be a career killer for me. If they get wind that I'm working on a project about men, that'll end it. And that's what we're facing. We absolutely need for there to be the Indiegogo campaign to be funded in order for us to make this documentary. And we're not asking for much. It's around 30 grand. This is, this and, is the uh, that Cassie J had. She not only yeah. had uh, her financial backers pull out when she said they yeah. wouldn't give them creative control, but... She also had uh, post-production staff quit on her because they didn't want to be associated with it. Do you feel yeah, comfortable no, I, telling us a bit more about your story? And, and oh, your... fuck yeah. I'll tell you why. Because I spent three fucking years in therapy, man. I'm cool. <laughs> if I had been talking about this like two years ago, I would be crying right now. But I will tell you a little bit about it, okay? Because I think it's important. I met her in 2010. Before that, I had been married for 20 years. My wife and I, it was a slow drift and we separated. It wasn't like animosity or anything like that. It, we just fell away. We got married when we were kids. So anyway, we separate and uh, I fell in love and it looked great. I mean, she's like tall and pretty and she's intelligent and cultured and I was like, oh God, this is like a whole new beginning. And she loved my kids. My girls loved her. And uh, bit by bit, she started getting a little bit more touchy. And then she got angry a lot. And then it was like, I had to have a conversation with her like, hey, you're getting upset like every day. What do I do? Why? Am I that annoying? And uh, then she started getting different. It was like she was testing the water. She was seeing how I reacted to her being aggressive, I suppose, just emotionally. And then she started going further. The first thing she did I suppose physically, we were playing crazy eights, and uh, she was fine when she was winning, but when I won a hand or two, and I don't gloat, I'm not one of those people, I'm a nice guy when I play, she threw her cards in my face and said, I'm done, and marched off to the bedroom and lay in bed. And I thought she was joking, and then I walked in and said, are you serious? Like, what are you doing? The next time we were playing crazy eights, this was like a week or two later, we were at my apartment, and the same thing happened, except this time she did the thing where she puts her jacket on and she puts her purse on and then she starts to walk down the stairs. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Are you really leaving over a game of cards? Seriously? And I, I went down to the, she was on the landing and I was on the third step. And I said, you're acting like a big baby. And she whirled around and she pushed me up the stairs. And I landed on my back. And that was the first time anybody had ever laid hands on me. Like, I'm from fucking Dartmouth, and I've never been in a fight. I made it my whole life without ever getting hit. And I just asked her, what the hell was that? 
And then it sort of went from there. It escalated into a place where she started pushing me more. She pushed me against the walls a lot. Then one day when the kids were all gone out of the house, this is, this is going to sound horrible, but it, it is horrible. I was really excited, right? Because, you know, when the kids are out of the house, you're like, you know, your girlfriend's in the bed, and you sort of jump on your girlfriend. You're like, hey, you know, what are we going to do? What do you want to do? I'll do anything. I don't care, you know? Let's have some fun. Kids are gone. And in that moment where I was vulnerable, when I was like, I love you so much, I just want to have fun with you, she got really dark. All of a sudden, it was like a black cloud came over her face, and she slapped my arms. And I was like, what are you doing? And then she hit me again, and I happened to have been naked at the time. So then she kind of got up, and she was grabbing me under the armpits, by the way, she outweighed me by 45 pounds, and she's four inches taller. And she threw me against the wall. And I was like, fuck, you know? And all of a sudden, she attacked me. And you know when you're, I don't know if you've ever been assaulted, but like when somebody's really sort of hitting a lot, the safest place to be is like when you grab onto them. So I did that. I'm like, holy fuck. And she started scratching the shit out of me, and then she just literally beat the living crap out of me. And... Uh, that that was like the first time it got to the place of absolute, a full on, I'm gonna die kind of violent attack. And it sort of progressed from there. I'll just make this short. She went through a deeper and deeper cycle of violence or a cycle of abuse. It's like there's a tension building phase, and then a need for release, which comes from the violence, and then. The cycle repeats, and it's an addiction. The deeper the tension, the higher resolution you need for the release. So the acts of violence get deeper. That's why people wind up getting killed in a domestic violence situation, because the abuser starts to get more and more and more violent. With her, it was so strange and so dark. She became more controlling and got better and better and better at finding ways to hurt me. But her violence went into a very, very dark place in that she started attacking more vulnerable areas. Like, she, at first, only attacked my torso and my limbs and scratched my legs and hit me and threw me around. But then she started to strangle me. And then she started kicking me in the groin. And eventually, down the road, she went to this place where... She would attack my face and maul my face to pieces to the point where I couldn't leave the house for a couple of weeks at a time. And if you can understand that kind of violence, when you get to a person's face, I mean, serial killers who kill somebody and then they, like, stab their face, that's messed up. That's like the destruction of the total self type of thing. And by the end of it, she was also more and more controlling. She took away the phone. She took away my phone. She kept me in the basement. She took away my clothes. She took away my glasses. It got horrible. So that's basically that in a nutshell. And then I finally got out of there with the help of a transgendered, female-to-male, 19-year-old, crusty punk kid who actually got my ass out of there. So, yeah, that's part of the story, too. Thank God he was a witness because he saw what happened to me all through that year. And then uh, he saw her have a psychological, mental breakdown, a dissociative state. And then he actually got me out of there. And uh, he was with me through the entire healing journey as well. And he's part of the documentary. He was the first person to film the beginning of it. I just wanted to add something to what Jasmine was saying in terms of before there's violence, it's domestic, and that you do consciously choose that. And something that Mal said in the sense, you know, that if when something about that person changes, you stop loving them, then you didn't really love them in the first place. I think that that's a very masculine way to approach things. Women are a little bit different, but... There is that, you know, like when you said, uh, for some reason I had complicated grief or something like that, I was just like, why would that be, you know, for some strange reason? No, of course you had grief. And it wasn't even necessarily that you were grieving leaving the woman she became. You were grieving leaving the woman you fell in love with. You lost her long before you left her. And of course you would be grieving the loss of her or the illusion of her or who she was when you met her and fell in love with her. And this is one of the things that really strikes me about men is that even when you look at the length of time that it takes to get over a, the breakdown of a relationship, for women it's an average of like something like two months before they're ready to start dating again. And for men it can be up to two years. 
before they're ready to take the plunge again and before they've fully gotten over that loss. And I think that that speaks to a different way that maybe men attach to women versus how women attach to men and that somebody that a man could say, well, just because she became a violent psycho doesn't mean I stopped loving her, right? You know, like that really speaks to how men love. And the very fact that you can have sort of this feminist mythology that men are incapable of love, that they're incapable of attachments, that they're incapable of this sort of deeper empathy. When women are the ones who seem to be more able to just cut a relationship off and not just cut it off, but then want to expunge the man from their lives. This is something that women do more than men is, you know, they take the kids and they cut the man off of access because they don't want to make awkward conversation five minutes every weekend with him. They don't, that's an inconvenience to them. They want him out, gone, like completely expunged from their lives. And so it's just, I just thought that that was something that, and I think maybe this is largely why men don't report. It's not necessarily because they're ashamed. It's not necessarily because they feel like they have no help. I think a lot of the time it's because they actually love the woman that they're with and they don't want her to go to jail. They don't want her to be in trouble. They don't want her to be harmed. They just want her to stop. Next, let's take a look at a few letters from the mailbag with our clips from Top Kick Topics number four, Doge Guevara. Just to throw it in there, the average Facebook user now has about 338 friends. The median number is quite a bit lower. It's about 200. I think that where that comes from is there are people who value their personal worth on the number of friends they have. So they add as many people as they can, even though they're not going to actually keep track of them. And they're not really yeah. friends. They're more like people they met once, you know, yeah. in passing. Yeah, so, yeah, so the, the median is probably more of an indication of how many relationships you can really maintain to some degree, at least with the communication systems that we have available to us at the moment. Because, you know, each one has its limitations verbally, you know, you can only really feel like you belong to someone who speaks the same language. Now we have visually, so we can all feel like we belong to people who are uh, under the same symbol, I suppose. But yeah, overpopulation is bad. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to read into this. If, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the reason why MGTOW is going MGTOW is because it's completely untenuable now for a lot of men to have a pair bond and deal with the kind of crap that they're expected to deal with in a pair bond with a woman. Now, essentially, the government has made it too expensive to marry women because of all of the stupid laws, uh, the alimony, the domestic violence. And for a man who wants children, I'd imagine it'd be extremely stressful to run the gamut of potentially losing your children if your increasingly fickle generations of women decide that you don't do it for them anymore. So it seems like MGTOW is more of a response to the way that government is structuring pair bonding now. I mean, it could also be a response to what uh, is proposed as the essential nature of women, which is that they only wish to have men for their resources. But even the idea that that could be offensive, that could be morally and emotionally offensive to men, suggests that, because uh, if, if it wasn't, I mean, think about it, if that was something that was just a given in our society, that me women would only want men for their resources, then probably we wouldn't get upset or offended by that, because it would just be a given. I'm trying to go deeper with that, but it's hard to go deeper in a panel. By necessity, it's a little bit more shallow. However, it can be very useful for presenting an opportunity for people to think themselves. So they listen to the different people talking about something, and it inspires them to continue the discussion in their own head, rather than uh, just presenting something in the form of a lecture, which is not a really good way for people to learn. Discussions are good ways for people to learn, lectures are not. So you may not need to join in on the discussion because you already know what you, what you feel you know, which is everything about this particular subject matter, which is fine. But it, I think the discussion invites people who don't already know everything to just, you know, learn a bit more. And that's a lot of people. There are a lot of people out there who know nothing about men's rights, are nothing about the gender dynamic stuff that we talk about, nothing about any of it. And discussion is the best place for them to start learning and start thinking about it themselves, which is really the end goal, getting people thinking. And, you know, not necessarily getting them maybe away from thinking that they know everything. And uh, so that's what I would say. I think we have different shows for different reasons, and that's the way we roll. And plus, you know, like Honey Badger Radio, we're only going to continue to evolve. If you guys want to see more stuff in regards to just approaching philosophical issues that do 
encourage that discussion and that self-reflection like Allison said like put it in the comments below and it's something that we'll definitely consider after all we're very big supporters of the free market of ideas so I guess uh, I'll move on and Allison if you need to take off that's cool yeah I guess I can put my seat as if, if you wish yeah. oh that would be funny yeah. <laughs> empty yeah. the seat um, <laughs> just, just make her avatar just like slide down under the desk and be like where oh, did she yeah. go <laughs> yeah I don't know how to do that. But I think I can figure it out, though. I'm not sure how to do that. No, I what are do you that. doing? I not can... under the desk. Yo, oh, God! <laughs> I want to fuck your mouth. <laughs> what am I a puppet? I'm a puppet. What do you want me to do? Fuck your mouth. <laughs> oh Jesus. Okay, I'm 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 going now. Bye. She's got zerking to do. Zerking, I say. Please don't ever put me under the desk, Brian. Please. I can't, you know, you're a dog. I get accused of being a fur fag now, even though I don't know where it comes from. I think that people just see an animal and they think that guy must be a furry. Nobody else on in Honey Badger Radio gets accused of it, though, even though they're represented by badgers and pandas and other animals and yellow people. Only me. All right. I'll, I'll boot up the cartoon soon again, and then we'll start getting all that shit. <laughs> there again. you go. I'll boot up the other kid in we'll fantasy spread world. The, spread the accusations. Jonathan writes, What is your opinion of anti-feminists who are religious? You often compare feminism to religion, although you have spoken positively about Christianity, if only in comparison to feminism. Have I? Have I? Uh, is he talking to someone else? I don't know. I think they're talking about us as a collective. Because again, now that I'm a communist, that means that we all think the same thoughts and we share everything. And uh, here, you know, we're all in the bread line together. You get a gulag. You're, 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 you're the dog, Borg. You're the, the dog, if you will. Yeah, I don't know who they're referring to when they say that we've spoken positively about Christianity. I mean, we probably speak a little bit more positively about them compared to other religions. Once again, an example of, you know, which is the lesser of all the evils. It's the most neutered of all the evils at this point. You know, of the two big Abrahamic evils, it's the most feeble and anemic at this point. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, if you mean, when, when you say spoken positively about Christianity, do you mean did not run it through the ground in the same way that we have feminism or other, as Mike puts it, Abrahamic religions, such as Islam? Well, I don't know that those two things are comparable. And from my point of view, I, I find that, uh, oh, you know what it could be? It could be from the one time that I had Dean on, and he kind of went on a tirade because he was getting tired of atheists uh, attacking Christians because he is one or he's a Catholic, I believe. But just because we let him on and we let him talk about his views doesn't necessarily mean that we are for Christianity. I mean, I think that we're for individualism and individual freedoms. And if somebody wants to be, at least for me, if somebody wants to be religious, I don't care. As far as needing spokespeople and celebrities, I think that that is starting to happen. And I want to say this too. I am the person, one of the people anyway, that typically reaches out to anybody I can get my hands on a message or whatever to ask them if they'd be interested in coming on the show, to ask them if they would like to come on for a fireside chat, to ask them if they know who we are at Honey Badger Radio. And you'd be surprised at the number of people who are pretty prominent and they could in fact have very loud voices and they have confided in us and I mean in all forms of entertainment and media that and academia that have come to us and said you know I like your show I watch it I agree with a lot of what you guys are saying if not all of it but they don't feel mm, for lack of a better term they don't feel safe to be vocal it's actually reminds me of gamergate when gamergate was happening and there were you know you heard people like i believe uh oliver campbell and uh, total biscuit and and stuff that the louder voices would say oh i've been approached by many you know devs and people in the games industry that have said i agree with you guys but i can't talk about it because the ramifications will impact too poorly on my career and I've had that happen too, where people have come to me and said, I watch your show and I'd be really surprised at who it is. And then they say, but you know, I have mouths to feed and if I came forward, it would, it, I could lose my job. So it's just a matter of getting to the point where 
we have enough people fighting against it that those that have like the ability to get a lar larger audience will come forward and speak out. Yeah, it starts with no one talking about it, and it ends with almost everyone talking about it. And what what would the intermediate stage look like? It it looked like this. <laughs> it looked like people being in this halfway house where they're sort of half acknowledging it. Maybe a few years from now they'll be three quarters acknowledging it. Yeah, that's ex patience. Empires are built on the backs of the guilty. If you leave humans to their own devices, they will build things voluntarily. But if you force them to build things using artificial guilt, they will build things much faster than they would voluntarily. So, anthropically speaking, the civilizations which run on guilt will outmatch and outnumber the civilizations who run on volunteerism. And they have. Completely. The guilt on which this empire has been running for thousands of years is men's guilt. <laughs> men's rear, if you will. And for most of our history, the men we demonized mostly were the men over there, the men far away or the men long ago. Because we were still in competition with the men over there, for one thing. But we're overgrown now with first world problems. There's no worthy enemy left for this empire. So what we should be doing is dropping the threat narrative, dropping the guilt engine that got us here. But we can't. We're addicted to it because it got us here. We're addicted to male guilt. And so we're doing it to our own men as well as instead of not doing it to the other men we're just doing it to our own men as well and this is an unwinnable war we're stuck in a war against ourselves we haven't figured out how to declare peace in this context so we're declaring war and calling it peace we're taking freedoms away and pretending it's for the sake of freedom i like to think that we're you know only badger radio and the like trying to operate as peacemakers or something and not the blessed ones in the bible we're, we're not the meek with the geeks. Lastly, we will speak with Mike Buchanan, who is fighting for the rights of men and boys in the UK with Fireside Chat number 36. Tell me about the Justice for Men and Boys. It's a political party that you are starting up. Is that correct? It is. We launched back in February 2013, so a little over three years ago now. And to my constant surprise, we remain the only political party in the English-speaking world campaigning for the human rights of men and boys, which are assaulted in so many of the areas. In our 2015 General Election Manifesto, we outlined 20 areas where the human rights of men and boys are assaulted by the actions and inactions of the state. Almost always, but not always, but almost always to advantage women and girls. And there isn't in the UK in 2016 a single area where the human rights of women and girls specifically are assaulted by the state. The major parties are almost universally anti-male. The only exception, I mean, if you look at the House of Commons, we have 650 MPs, and there is only one MP who ever talks out on men's or boys' issues. His name's Philip Davis, and he'll be speaking at the conference in London, I'm very pleased to say, on the justice uh, gender gap. And he first came to people's notice when you know as, as a, the debacle with jess phillips well, yes, no no well. no he well he first came to people's attention three or four years before that he's a conservative mp and he was outraged because he kept on hearing that women are very badly done by in the criminal justice system in terms of sentencing and so on so um, being an independent kind of guy independent minded kind of guy he looked into it and he found the truth was the exact opposite men are far more harshly treated by the criminal justice system in you know in just every respect um, there was a piece by William Collins, who's just an extraordinary British blogger, and he calculated that in the UK, if men were sentenced with the same leniency as women, five out of six men in British prisons wouldn't be there. Wow. And it's a similar situation, I think, in the States. I've seen some analysis in the States which shows, you know, so men are more readily sentenced to prison. They serve longer sentences and the whole shooting match. The current Prime Minister, David Cameron, is a feminist. I mean, he, he might deny it on occasion, but uh, everything he does kind of points in that points in that direction. Mm. And in 2009, he announced his intention to introduce all women shortlists to the Conservative Party, which, as you can imagine, went down not very well. All, and, all uh, women shortlists? All women shortlists. The Labour Party, the, the major left-wing party, has for quite some years now had all women shortlists. So, you know, in some constituencies, you can only become an MP to become a candidate if you have the right genitals. It's as simple as that. Well, with the Conservative government, we still have a Minister for Women and Equalities, Nikki Morgan, and the damn woman is also the Minister for Education. And here we've had in the UK a war on boys and young men for almost 30 years, and the Department for Education doesn't give a damn. It's part of the problem. It's not part of the solution. They do not recognise the underachievement of, 
males as anything to worry about, anything to invest in. They are utterly disinterested in the issue. We have in the UK a male-female suicide differential of 3.5 to 1. It's more than doubled in 30 years. And the government is spending one and a half million pounds on six studies, six research studies on suicide. None of them are tasked to look at male suicide specifically, mm. although it, it clearly is a gendered issue. So that's one and a half million pounds. And at the same time, the government is spending 30, three zero million pounds encouraging more women into engineering. So any woman who does the one year MSc course on engineering at Brunel University today gets given £23,000, what's that, $35,000, I guess, that is denied to her male colleagues. We almost never hear from feminists, interestingly enough. I mean, every month we produce or hand out a uh, Lying Feminist of the Month Award and um, Toxic Feminist of the Month Awards and, and so on. But the mainstream media never pick up on this. So here we have, you know, major prominent feminists and we have a, you know, our political party saying this woman lied. Mm -hmm. you know but the media never pick up on it it's really quite extraordinary they sort of leave us alone and hope we'll go away you know in the 20 areas that we refer to in our manifesto probably 17 or 18 of those areas feminists have made the world worse for men and boys and that's acting through the state mm. and it's the reason we're probably spending less time than we used to on attacking feminism and spending more time on practical things the easiest battle against feminism is to frustrate it politically and I think that's just a small challenge in comparison with the, if you like, the cultural narrative challenge, as, as important as that is. Can you talk a little bit about the books? Sure. The first one was inspired by uh, David Cameron's decision, as uh, I mentioned earlier, to uh, or his wish to introduce all women shortlists. So that was called David and Goliath, uh, David Cameron, heir to Harmon. And it was a part of a slow awakening to just how evil radical feminism was. And I wrote a book after that. I spent 30 years as a business executive. And I was sick to death of hearing about the glass ceiling, which to me is just nonsensical. In 30 years, I never saw any evidence of anything like it. If anything, women were preferenced in recruitment and promotional terms. And uh, my last book, which is selling quite well, I'm pleased to say, is uh, Feminism, the Ugly Truth. Mm -hmm. And it's going very well. It was published as an e-book um, in 2012. And I updated it slightly and published it as a paperback just a few months ago. But it's selling nicely. Yes, well, it's good. I'd rather talk, if I may, about the BBC in general. Yeah, why don't you tell us about the BBC um, in general? You have a beef with them? Oh, oh my God. Do I have a beef? Yeah, they are just appalling. But, you know, they are the state broadcaster, so you'd expect them to follow what their political masters demand. Whether, you know, it tends to be very left-wing, but for all that. But no, they are truly astonishing. We had about, um, we've probably had over 100 appearances on BBC radio or TV but they're almost always limited to fairly small issues. So, for example, tomorrow morning, I'll be speaking on um, BBC Radio Scotland about a decision by Muirfield Golf Course to continue refusing women members. So it's kind of like, you know, yes, it's kind of a fairly interesting little story, but no. it's, it's not too big. But if you compare us with, you know, their behaviour towards us at the general election was particularly vile. We only had two candidates, myself and a guy called Ray Barry. Now, the BBC run Radio Husting in the week or two before the general election. Ray Barry wasn't even informed of the Hustings in his constituency. It, you know, he only learns about it the next day. And in my case, they informed me a day or two beforehand that they'd invited an all-female audience who would be asking mainly questions about women's issues. Fairly astonishing, I think. I mean, I was up against the Shadow Minister for Women and Equalities, but they were totally shameless. So whenever the microphone was near me, I would take the opportunity to raise a men's issue, such as, I don't know, male genital mutilation, for example. And the microphone quickly disappeared. <laughs> but, you know, whenever they do any gendered issues, any program, it is always feminist friendly. And they'll present um, people like Rouge V as being sort of mainstream MRAs. It's incredibly cynical. But the other thing I wanted to mention was the Women's Equality Party. Now, isn't that, isn't that just a wonderful title, women's equality? And so, of course, you know, there are no areas in which women are disadvantaged in women and girls in the UK. So, of course, what else could they be after but more privileging? And, of course, that's exactly what they're going for. We hope you enjoyed this clip show. If there was a clip from these shows that you think we should have shown, please leave a comment on the video and include a timestamp, for God's sakes. Thank you and badger on.